Thank you for listening to this podcast from TRE. Talk Radio Europe, your voice in Spain and around the world. For more information, please visit tre.radio. Gerard Sweeney presents Live on Era in association with emeraldconnection.net. Live on Era, presented by Gerard Sweeney. And a very good evening. It is Wednesday evening. Nice to have your company on this particular day. What is it? The 18th of October, 2023. Just in case you were wondering what year it was because the years are flying so quickly. I'm looking out the window What a horrible, horrible day. Um, it is almost dark and it's only just after six o'clock in Ireland. Uh, but it's almost dark. Really heavy cloud cover and lots and lots of rain. We'll talk more about the weather a little later on. Before we do anything on tonight's program can I say a big thank you to uh, Howard Brereton for uh, his program Spain Today much appreciated Howard let me turn down the speakers just a little bit there uh, he had some gremlins I'm having a couple of gremlins myself um, yeah there's I, I think it's to do with the weather um, that the connection isn't as solid as it should be so please forgive me if anything goes wrong and just bear with me uh, it shouldn't take too long to rectify itself if I need to do that but bear in mind that what I do in studio is about 30 seconds before you hear it so you might be hearing something for a minute before you actually hear any clearance or anything like that anyway there you go all right um (laughs) um howard thank you very much indeed look forward to your company again tomorrow evening between six and seven for um another edition of spain today on the program today what have we got well in the first hour you've got me uh, giving you plenty of news and playing some music for you as well. I've got some new music for you and there's plenty of news that I can be giving to you. And in the second hour of the programme, I'm going to be talking to Richard O. Raw. And Richard has just uh, presented the world with his new book, which is called Steak Knife's Dirty War. Steak Knife was the code name of Freddy Scappatici. Um, he, um, from the 19, late 1970s through to his eventual exposure in 2003, he was the jewel in the crown of a British infiltration system designed to cause mayhem and chaos in the IRA's military operations. Uh, Ricky O'Rourke gained unprecedented access to Scapatici's former comrades who reveal extraordinary details of the inner workings of the IRA's internal security unit. Headed by Scapatici, this secretive group was known locally as the Nutting Squad, owing to its fearsome reputation for the abduction, interrogation, torture and execution of volunteers suspected of working for the British or the RUC. Uh, that conversation I've already had with Richard O'Raw. I spoke to him last Thursday, in fact, so you're going to hear that interview in the second hour of the programme. As I said, we have other bits and pieces of news for you as well. As always, if you would like to get in contact, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, there are two ways of doing that. You can send a WhatsApp message to plus three four six four five ninety nine sixty seven ninety five, or send an email to studio at tre.radio. So if you've got nothing planned for the evening, you can settle back and relax and hopefully enjoy the program between now and nine o'clock. If you have something planned, well, sure, bring me along with you as well. Now, at the outset, I suppose I should say well done and thank you to the Irish rugby team for the huge lift that they gave the country in recent weeks um, at the World Cup. Although there has been a national high, there was also, of course, a sense of a national low after Saturday evening's defeat by the All Blacks. But it was a great run by a great team and nobody is saying anything differently uh, or anything different. We knew that Johnny Sexton would be hanging up his boots when the Irish campaign in France came to an end, albeit sooner than we would have liked. And yesterday, Keith Earls confirmed that he is to retire from rugby with immediate effect. The 36-year-old announcements, 36-year-old's announcement had been expected with Ireland head coach Andy Farrell paying tribute to him following the 28-24 defeat to New Zealand on Saturday night in Paris. This afternoon, well no, it wasn't this afternoon, it was yesterday afternoon, Earls made the news official releasing a statement through Irish and Munster rugby confirming his retirement. I know the lads are back in Ireland at this stage and again, thank you for a wonderful campaign and we look forward to the next one. Now, news from Madrid that landed on the email today as autumn has finally arrived. Looking out the window here, it looks like winter has arrived. But anyway, and Halloween approaches, the Irish Embassy in Madrid has announced their collaboration with Tourism Ireland and Bordbia to present Halloween S. Irlandes. 
in the emblematic Mercado de la Paz in Madrid. Now, Samhain is the Irish name for the festival, which dates back 2,000 years and marks the end of the harvest season, the coming of winter and the beginning of the Celtic New Year. As it revolves closely around the harvest and the changing of the seasons, the Mercado serves as the perfect backdrop to the many activities that have been organised this year in Madrid. From the 25th to the 31st of October, the story of Samhain and its Irish origins come to life through actors, music, dance, pumpkins, carvings, uh, tricks, uh, sorry, trick or treats, and tastings of delicious Irish produce. If you, um, uh, you are more than welcome to, if you, if you're available, you're more than welcome. And if you happen to be in the Madrid area to join the festivities between the 25th and 31st of October, um, you can do it with or without fancy dress. And the embassy is encouraging, encouraging all of us to share with family and friends if we can. A complete lineup of the events can be found at Eventos en La Paz. Okay, so E V E N T O S E N L A P A Z. So Eventos en La Paz.com. Log on there and the whole. Shooting gallery, the whole kit and caboodle is laid out for you. And if you can't make it to all of the events, well, sure you might make it to some of them. The rumor has it that you may come across Dracula <laughs> or the odd banshee or the puka. A puka is a ghost during your visit. And you may be lucky enough to win a fantastic Irish food hamper as well in the raffle. So there we go. Thanks to Anne Marie for sending all of that information to me from the embassy. Received it this morning and happy to pass on the information. Again, if you want to take a look at that website, it's Eventos N. LaPath.com. A record number of students received their results of the junior cycle exams today. So there'll be celebrations galore. 70,727 sat the exams this year, to be precise, which is a 5% increase in 2022. It's the first time that the number of candidates taking junior cycle exams or its junior cert or intercert predecessors predecessors has exceeded 70,000. It's the second year that all candidates have sat exams under the fully reformed junior your cycle curriculum under 29 sorry until 2019 uh, only the newly revised subjects of english science and business studies had been examined and then exams were cancelled for most of students most students in 2020 and in 2021 and you know why that was assessment procedures were adjusted again to take account of disrupted learning during the pandemic the adjustments included some changes to the timing or requirements of practical or course coursework components last year it's Students did not receive the results until November. The State Examinations Commission has said that a significant increase in the number of teachers marking exam papers and the use of online marking in almost all junior cycle subjects has made it possible to deliver this year's junior cycle results five weeks earlier. Students, I'm sure, are very relieved. But when you consider we used to get them and they were getting them um, up to a few years ago, they were getting them in middle of September. So, yeah, schools will go on anyway to combine all the exam exam results that students received today with outcomes from classroom-based assessments, uh, short courses and other areas of school learning. And all of this will go towards creating a junior cycle profile of achievement uh, for each student. So anyway, well done to everybody who sat the exam and hopefully everybody um, feels good about what they got this evening as well. Now, crowds gathered to watch yeah, it was something that is a joy when I'm traveling between Ireland and Spain on the ferry. And um, it's not always possible because it, it can be extremely rocky in the Bay of, Bis- Bay of Biscay, as you may know if you travel yourself. But one of the great joys is to watch the pods of dolphins and whales jumping. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. But crowds gathered to watch as a pod of dolphins were spotted swimming down the River Lee in Cork with one local videographer calling it an amazing sight to see. Social media footage shows people lining the river along George's Quay and Father Matthew Quay on Sunday, Saturday, I beg your pardon, as the dolphins swam by from, from daylight hours into dusk. Dolphins and orcas have previously been spotted swimming along the River Lee, but sightings are rare. When Cork-based videographer Ryan Lynch heard the dolphins had been spotted in the river, he grabbed his drone to film them swimming slowly as the sun set. And what beautiful pictures there were too. He captured aerial footage showing the small pod of dolphins' backs slowly emerging and disappearing in the water 
which he uploaded to his Instagram account. And there's some of those online if you would like to see them. So there we go. There's a couple of stories to get you started this morning or this afternoon. Don't know where I got this morning, but this afternoon <laughs> on the program. Um, and you will be glad, to, you will be glad to know that I'm feeling much better. Thank you for asking. Uh, last week I was bunged up with a head cold and I was right through the week, but um, feeling much, much better now and uh, delighted not to be sounding as nasally as I was. I've played tracks from the album already. It's newly released from Finbar Fury. Let's take another one. Here's a song called She Wants to Ride Horses. Let's her, let her gallop off. She wants to ride horses. I love the sunshine. She wants to move mountains, but I like it here just fine. She's ready to to races. She's steeple chase places. Born on the wrong side of me, standing in line. She wants pairs of the moonlight. I see them when she smiles. She wants go across the diamonds. I see them in her eyes. She holds on the aces in her precious hand. She's the measure and treasure land. She's all I believe in my reason to be. She's everything I love and she means the world to me. And my mother, she tells me I'm the fool wasting time. But I told her that I love her and I will all my life. She's kind, she's clever in disguise To choose her to your riches should I have to be blind Your love that I love is walking by my side A jewel so rare I have wished on my life She's all I believe in my reason to be She's everything I love and she means the world to me And my mother, she tells me I'm the fool wasting time But I told her that I love her and I will own my life She's all I believe in my reason to be She's everything I love and she means the world to me And my mother, she tells me I'm the fool wasting time But I told her that I love her and I will all my life She wants to write hearts I love the sunshine. That's lovely, isn't it? It comes from Finbar Fury from his current album, which is called Moments in Time. It's called She Wants to Ride Horses. I'm going to take a very quick break. And if you wouldn't mind hanging in there, I will come back to you in just over two minutes. And uh, I've got some more news for you. So don't go anywhere. Live on Era, presented by Ger Sweeney. There you are. You didn't go anywhere. Fair play to you. Thank you very much for tuning my way on this Wednesday evening. It's nice to be with you for the Irish programme live on ERA. And um, yeah, with you until nine o'clock. Congratulations to the two Irishmen who emerged victorious from the World Ploughing Championship held in Latvia over the weekend. Eamon Tracy from County Carlo and John Whelan from County Wexford retained their Supreme World Ploughing Champion titles in their respective classes. Mr. Tracy in the conventional class and Mr. Whelan in the reversible class. The Irish and world champions had to compete against the best ploughmen from 36, sorry, 26 other countries, mainly from Europe, but also from the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia and Kenya. The 68th World Ploughing Championships were held in the town of Kuldiga in Western Latvia. I hope I am pronouncing that correctly. 
Yeah, Western Jer, you said it right. <laughs> you know what I mean. Gardaí have confirmed that they are investigating an incident of criminal damage at an ancient Neolithic passage tomb in County Sligo. Why do people do this? Isn't it awful? A technical examination of the scene has been carried out by the Garda Divisional Scenes of Crime Unit and investigations are ongoing. Photographer Ken Williams visited the historical site at Carrow Keel over the weekend and took photographs of words and shapes scratched into stones at the tomb, which is over 5,000 years old. Mr. Williams, who regularly photographs the at archae- archaeological sites, said that it was the worst that he had ever seen and that he reported the vandalism to Gardaí and the NMS. Access to the monuments were closed by the office, the office of Public Works, the OPW, on Monday to allow for investigations by them, uh, the National Monument Service, the NMS as well, and Gardaí. Mr Williams said that nine stones in total and 11 surfaces had been carved into. He said that the passage tomb uh, where he found the markings in is a very awkward spot to get to and you would have to get on your hands and knees to crawl into it. Hi. Huh? The NMS said that a sta- or sorry, in a statement that the etching of ex- um, extensive graffiti across various agricult- um, architectural stones of a number of passage tombs is being treated very, very seriously, as is the apparent collapse of an entrance stone to one of the tombs. Sligo County Council said it was dismayed at the mindless vandalism at the site. It said the cairns at Karakil are the first, uh, sorry, the final resting places of early Neolithic farmers. And it is shocking that anybody would think it appropriate to damage these sites left by our ancestors over 5,000 years ago. These monuments are fragile and need to be protected and treated with respect. The council has strongly supported the efforts to have the country's or the county's Neolithic landscape placed on the UNESCO World Heritage list. Speaking on RTE's News at One, Michael McDonough, who is the chief archaeologist, said, from the information that is being provided to us, it is one of the most significant incidences of such graffiti vandalism, which is um, increasing, unfortunately, that we have seen on a many on many of our national monuments in recent years. Mr. McDonough said that the NMS had seen an increase in vandalism, but added that an, um, an uptick in reporting and the use of social media is a contributing factor. In July last year, the government announced that a passage tomb landscape of Sligo, which includes Carrow Keels on the Ireland's on Ireland's World Heritage tentative list for consideration as UNESCO World Heritage Site, it described the passage tomb landscape in the county as representing the most westerly and one of the most dramatic expressions of a remarkable flourishing um, of the construction of ritual monuments across Europe between five and six millennia ago. Hmm. Will we stay with that uh, theme? Will we? Because a rare 15th century Irish manuscript found in France has been returned to Ireland for public display. Known by scholars as the Wren Manuscript. That's R-E-N-N-E-S now, right? So the, not W-R-E-N, so Wren Manuscript. It's believed the precious book may have been brought to France by an Irish army officer or noble person during the exodus of the wild geese in the late 17th century or early 18th century. Century. The 200 page vellum manuscript is on public display in the Glucksman Gallery in University College Cork, having been secured on loan from the City Library in Rennes in Brittany. The Rennes manuscript is beautifully decorated and contains a variety of material, including religious texts, place lore known as, now this is um, a word that I had difficulty when I was um, putting this together, uh, Din Shankas. Din Shankas, yeah, D I N N S H E A N, so Din Shankas, or Din Shankas, and a copy of the earliest known Irish translation of The Travels of John Mandeville, made in 1475. Wow. The manuscript is believed to have been compiled during the second half of the 15th century, possibly during the 1470s. Notes contained in the text indicate that the manuscript remained in Ireland until at least 1640s. The assumption is that the manuscript, like many more, uh, was taken uh, to France during the exodus of the wild geese in the 17th and 18th centuries. Following the um, signing of the Treaty of Limerick in 1691, many Irish soldiers that served in the Jacobite army are known to have been exiled in Brittany. The manuscript was eventually purchased by Christophe Paul de Robien, 
Uh, he uh, lived from 1698 to 1756. He was president of the Parliament of Brittany and he added it to his vast private collection. However, during the French Revolution, the contents of the De Robien library were confiscated and the manuscript became part of the public library in Rennes, where it is being held or has been held ever since. Uh, Professor Podrick O. Macoyne said that the manuscript is in remarkably good condition and illustrates the depth and quality of texts which were compiled by Irish scribes in the 1400s. We know that many, many books were taken abroad during that period, but very few survived. Irish manuscripts were also written on the continent from sources that were available there. So we know there must have been a big um, circulation of manuscripts. And here's one that survived, Professor O. McCoyne said. It's very important for our undergraduate students that they get to see these marvellous books that we talk about in our lectures. And um, here we have a remarkable opportunity to do that, to see such a beautiful manuscript in the flesh is a special experience, he said. Research carried out by Dr. Andrea Palandri indicates that, um, no, oh yeah, Taig or um, a traveling scribe is the author of the book. Um, that particular family were historians to the Osarul clan in the Tipperary Offord Offaly border area. And he was a professional scribe who traveled around Ireland collecting important texts that he then copied in manuscripts with certain patrons in mind, important families and chieftains, um, said Dr. Palandri. Part of the Wren manuscript was written in Kilcray, or Kilcray, about 20 kilometres outside Cork City, where a Franciscan friary ex- um, existed, as well as a, a castle, uh, which was the stronghold of Cormac um, McCarthy of Muscari. The scribe leaves us a note in the text telling us that he is in Kilcray um, on Monday, Thursday, um, uh, during Easter Holy Week. And then his comments about the piety of the community there, which has only given him the um, um, Eucharistic host to eat, leaving him hungry, Dr. Palandri said. Now, the Red Manuscript has been put on display, as I said, alongside the Book of Lismore, another important Irish manuscript from the same period. The Book of Lismore was written um, for um, Finian uh, McCarthy Rybock, the uh, Lord of Kyrbra from 1478 to 1505. In 2020, the Duke of Devonshire and the Chatswold Settlement Trust donated the Book of Lismore to UCC. The exhibition titled Return of the Exiles has been supported by Forest, ne- Forest Naguelga and will continue at the Gluxman in UCC until the 4th of November. Some of those old Irish names, they're difficult to get over when you're not used to pronouncing them. So sorry I fell over some of those as we went along our merry way. I got an email today from Mike Hanrahan. Mike, no stranger to the programme, as you know. You will have heard his music and his dulcet tones chatting with me and with PJ Curtis uh, on a few occasions. And um, the note just said simply that the final song from the Box Room series is now on release called Craggy Hell. He said, thanks to everybody who plays my songs and read these press releases. Radio has been really good to me and especially to Stockton's Wing, but it's a changing landscape. So I'm off now to new, exciting, creative zones. I leave you with Craggy Hill, he says. Craggy Hill was inspired by the horror of reading about the Irish Civil War. One of my heroes, he says, of that period is poet, pacifist and activist Eva Gore Booth. She and the women of the revolution are at the heart of this lyric. The songs from the box room, the album that it comes from, uh, represents a very creative period of my life, he says. It gave me many new songs, a few poems and a short film about the Irish Cultural Revolution and Aldoc, uh, or sorry, with Aldoc and artist Mick O'Dee. Beautiful collaborations with so many good friends, old and new. And as ever, he said, I am blessed to have my buddy Gavin Glass on the desk in production for Craggy Hill, along with the wonderful Rachel Grace and her exquisite vocals. Let's take a listen to the final track from that album, then from Mike Hanrahan, shall we? It's simply called Craggy Hill, and it's a nice one. Take a listen. Hope you enjoy it. On a craggy hill A long ago winter's morning We watched the sun Hanging with the moon We thought this bloody war 
would soon be over. One day soon, you said one day soon. But for you and me, this war never ended. We fought side by side, and soon we turned the gun. In this bitter, twisted world of our envy, is the battle ever won? I often think about you in springtime, on a summer breeze when I hear the cuckoo shrill, when the autumn falls around me. Thunder. I think of you on Craggy Hill. We left our dreams somewhere on the hillside, where the hazel and the wild flower bloom. Ever since that day we parted. Of you, you the poet who wrote about her comrades, you the artist who painted her in steel. All of you, the vanquished revolution. I don't know um, what the new exciting creative zones are that Mike Hanrahan is heading off to, but I have asked him to make sure and keep me up to date. But I have my spies on it as well. (laughs) I do. (laughs) I was talking to somebody today and I said, did you know that Mike is off to it? No, never heard that. No, no, no. So, um, yeah, they're working on it. We'll find out. We'll get to the bottom of it. Mike, if you happen to be listening, give us a clue, will you? (laughs) <laughs> Let's do a quick break. I'll have more news for you and some more new music or some more music as well for you just afterwards. Live on air, presented by Ger Sweeney. I was listening earlier on to uh, various talk radio Euro presenters talking about weather forecasts. I know that there is rain forecast for many areas, but temperatures are still quite high. I think Malaga was around 27 degrees or thereabouts today. And um, I'm saying this because just while Mike Hanrahan was playing, I took the opportunity to pop into the living room and I put some more coal (laughs) and more timber on the fire. (laughs) <laughs> a far cry from where some of our listeners might be this evening. But there you have it. A brand new 6.3 million euro civic centre um, and library has been officially opened in Virginia in County Cavan. The uh, development of the Virginia Civic Cultural and Library Services Centre has taken place around the historic Ramore uh, theater, which opened in 1999 in a deconsecrated church. The neighboring parochial house had been renovated into a box office, a lobby and bar area for the theater, as well as office space and an interactive 
Tourist Information Centre. The new centre also includes a multi-purpose performance and meeting space and a new civic plaza for outdoor events, as well as an an extensive range of books. The new library also has a sensory toy library and computer suite. The project was delivered with 4.7 million euro in funding from the Rural Regeneration Development Fund through the Department of Rural and Community Development. A further 1.5 million euro was provided by Cavan County Council and Cohirlock of Cavan County Council, a man by the name of Councillor Philip Brady hailed the official opening day as a historic day in Virginia, saying that it was one of the most significant investments in the cultural infrastructure the county has seen. Minister for Rural and Community Development, Heather Humphreys TD, attended the opening and said that the centre would play a key role in the day-to-day life of the community. Cavan County Council's Chief Executive Tommy Ryan said that the centre was a -a once-in-a-generation landmark facility. That's fabulous. Well done. And uh, wish everybody in Virginia, in County Cavan, the very best of luck with that. Now, Turismo Costa del Sol has participated in the Let's Talk About Andalusia in Ireland event in the Irish city of Cork, an event organised by the Department of Tourism, Culture and Sports of the Government of Andalusia, aimed at travel agencies, tour operators and specialised press in Ireland. Margarita del Cid, CEO of Tourism um, Costa, Costa del Sol has expressed her satisfaction because the Costa del Sol has aroused the interest of attendees in one of the most relevant markets for tourism in the province of Malaga. And that has best recovered record, recovering records um, regarding uh, time since the pandemic. In this sense, according to data from the latest tourism situation bulletin, more than 185,000 Irish people have stayed in hotels and apartments on the Costa del Sol in the first eight months of the year, which represents an increase of 23 3 percent compared the, to the previous year um, and the same period in 2019. Regarding arrivals at Malaga Airport, the increase is 9.1 percent. The programme for the day, which encouraged networking among the 30 representatives of the Irish tourism sector, included a dinner and a workshop in which Irish and Andalusian business people participated. Turismo Costa del Sol demonstrated, in the words of the CEO, as a destination that, uh, sorry, as a as destination that, thanks to an unbeatable climate, is open 365 days a year so that Irish tourists can always find something of interest in the province of Malaga, as well as high quality accommodation and services along the Costa del Sol while they enjoy the much heralded gastronomy. There was no mention of the A7. No, <laughs> they, they, they keep those things away. Del Cid, <laughs> Miss Del Cid said that during the event, there were many opportunities for sharing experiences and establishing connections, thus facilitating the marketing of the tourist uh, resources of the Costa del Sol. She said that people establish new contacts and they look forward to maintaining and building on those in the very near future. And so say all of us. Well done. Uh, motorists. In Ireland, who commit traffic offences like speeding or not wearing a seatbelt on bank holiday weekends will face higher penalties under proposed new legislation. This initiative is one of a number of measures that the government is working on to address the recent increase in fatalities and serious injuries occurring on Irish roads. Under the new Road Traffic Measures Bill 2023, powers would be granted to vary the number of penalty points during specific times when road safety risks are higher. Road safety data shows bank holiday weekends have a higher level of road deaths and serious injuries linked to driving offences. Minister Jack Chambers outlined to Cabinet how he, uh, sorry, how increasing points for uh, specified periods is likely to have a positive impact on driver behaviour. There were 46 fatal or serious injury collisions um, over the February, June and August bank holiday weekends this year. Data also shows that there were almost 10,000 speeding detections over the same weekends. The move to increase penalty points for specific periods like bank holiday weekends has been successfully introduced in other jurisdictions, including Australia. Other proposals being brought by Minister Chambers include a change to intoxicant testing rules, whereby Garthi would be mandatorily uh, required to test for drugs at the scene of road collisions. The Minister is also preparing legislation to implement the recommendations in the recent speed limit review, which reduces baseline speed limits on 
on rural roads, as well as national secondary roads and roads in built-up and residential areas. The proposed legislation also contains measures to end an existing anomaly within the penalty point system where motorists who were caught committing multiple offences at the same time only receive penalty points for the higher offence. I did not know that particular one, though. Did not know that. Anyway, there's a lot of talk about that. Um, and a lot of people saying that it's just not workable. But they're doing it in other places, including Australia, as I said. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens um, if that is actually brought before the doll very soon. Right, let's have some more music. This is a fivesome, a band containing comprising five members from Dublin called Trinkets. It's called Playing It Shy. Today and it made me wanna cry. Another war on TV, and we're all so desensitized. from the tree but it was bitter inside we're on the eve of reckoning but we're so used to playing it shy I like it. That comes from a band from Dublin, five members of the Trinkets. And uh, that's their current single. It's called Playing It Shy. It turns out that Mike Hanrahan is not listening to the programme. Demerit points for Mr. Hanrahan. But somebody sent him a text and said, Sweeney just played you on Talk Radio Europe. So he was thrilled and he passed on his regards to um, those of you that are listening and hope that you enjoyed the song. He didn't give me any clue what he's doing, though. No, he didn't. He's too, he's too cute for that. Right. Let's do a quick break. Come back to me after that. I've got more news for you. And don't forget, in the second hour of the programme, we're going to be talking to Richard O'Raw about his new book, which is called Steak Knife's Dirty War. More details on that very shortly. Live on air, presented by Ger Sweeney. T-R-E, your voice in Spain. I just heard the ad for Transmatic. We'll say good evening to Rob and all the, the crew there. Uh, I, I believe my car is with them at the moment. <laughs> it should be. <laughs> Fingers crossed. I know I won't be seeing it for a while, Rob. I know, I know, I know. But 
but that's all right. I look forward to seeing it when I see it. Now, what have we got for you? Some more news, I promised I would tell you. And I also have some more um, music. Yes, indeed. We're heading towards the news. We're about, what, 13 and a half minutes away from that? Anyway, so more details on that shortly. President Michael D. Higgins has strongly criticised the head of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, for comments on the Middle East conflict, which she made on a visit to Israel last Friday. Ms. von der Leyen did not include a call for Israel's retaliation to conform with international law. President Higgins said that he agreed with those who criticised the intervention of the European Commission president. He said, I don't know where the source of these decisions was. I don't know where the legitimation for it was. And I don't know where the authority for it is. And I don't think it was helpful. He added... It may not have been meant to have a malevolent consequences, but certainly we need a better performance in relation to European Union diplomacy and practice. President Higgins also said that he had read and heard the statements from the Taoiseach and the Tonishta on the escalation of the conflict. And he said that Miss von der Leyen's, or Miss von der Leyen was not speaking for Ireland and she uh, wasn't making, for, sorry, she was not speaking for Ireland and she wasn't speaking for the opinions that they hold. He added, what one is seeing in this is a thoughtlessness and even reckless set of actions, and I don't think it's helpful. He said it was important to retain and insist on the veracity of cognizance of the international of international law. He said to announce in advance that you will break international law and to do so on an innocent population, it reduces all the code that was there from Second World War on protection of civilians, and it reduces it to tatters. Mr. Higgins also said that the um, unanimous revulsion at the killings by Hamas of civilians, and he had issued a statement on the horror of killing somebody at a music festival. Earlier, President Higgins warned that the world could could be at the verge of an abyss by rejecting um, multilateralism. His comments echoed those of UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who used the phrase at the weekend to describe the deteriorating situation in the Middle East. Speaking at the World Food Forum in Rome, President Higgins told delegates, we could be at the verge of an abyss as we reject multilateralism and see our future in ever increasing expenditure on armaments rather than on the provision of food. President Higgins also said that it is so important that future generations be allowed to look forward to a future of peace and to reject the suggestion that war is the national condition of humanity. He told the World Food Forum that our agri-food systems are broken and not fit for purpose. He said that they are causing our planet harm, leading to food dependency, food insecurity and to hunger. We will stay on the Middle East and um, Irish reaction to that on the Tonishta. Michal Martin has condemned the strike on Al-Hali Hospital in Gaza, resulting in the deaths of hundreds of people. Michal Martin said that he was appalled by the incident and called for the full facts of what happened to be established and those responsible must be held to account. Around 500 Palestinians, as we know at this stage, were killed in a blast at the hospital last night that Israeli and Palestinian officials blamed on each other. Mr. Martin said the rising toll of civilian casualties and civilian suffering in Israel and in the occupied Palestinian territories since Hamas's brutal attack on the 7th of October is horrifying. The Thonishta um, said that um, he echoes the UN Secretary General's call for humanitarian ceasefire to allow humanitarian aid to reach those now in desperate need in Gaza. Humanitarian corridors must be urgently established. He added hostages must be released immediately and unconditionally. The international community must work urgently to de-escalate this situation. Speaking on RTE's Morning Ireland, he said that an investigation should be carried out by the International Criminal Court, which has jurisdiction over Israel and the occupied territories. Attacks on hospitals and civilians civilians infrastructure represent a violation of international law, he said. He also said that it is absolutely vital that water, food and medical supplies are delivered to Gaza as soon as possible. Mr Martin said that the EU has made it clear that there must 
must be adherence to international law. He also said that evacuating Irish citizens currently in Gaza is dependent on the opening of the crossing at Rafa. This is the only effective route out, and so the opening of Rafa crossing involves discussions with the Egyptian authorities and the Israeli authorities. Mr Martin said there have been developments, I think, in the last hour or so in relation to that. I caught a glimpse of a news headline, but I just haven't had a chance to delve into it. But hopefully there is going to be move on that one very shortly. Let's go back to music, shall we? What have we got? Oh, yes, I've played tracks from this album before. And they're going to take another track from it. You haven't heard it yet. It's the title track. Galway musician, singer, songwriter, Alton Conlon. Title track, The Starlight Ballroom. Everybody came to the town that day Jackie in her old blue beer Ronan from Knock on a motorbike And Bridget from Tormachidi Oh pretty woman, how long must I dream? They were always the best of friends Here have my shoulder to cry But the start of the end came when Ronan went And Bridget caught his broad smile Jackie dear, little girl, dry your eyes In 1969 The Starlight Ballroom Tony Chambers and the San Antonio Played on the opening night Above the dance floor A sparkling night sky Made out of fairy light With a dancing fever We're gonna dance Lovely, isn't it? The Starlight Ballroom. Of course, everything that Alton does is lovely. Former guest on the programme as well. We must have him on again at some stage. Um, That's a lovely track. It's the title one from the new album called Starlight Ballroom. 
Lovely. The National Consultative Forum on International Security Policy broadly agreed that greater investment in the defence forces and in defending against cyber warfare was needed. In the report, which was published yesterday, the forum broadly agreed that there is pride in Ireland's global reputation in international affairs, but there was disagreement surrounding the definition of the terms neutrality or the term neutrality. Four meetings were held in Cork, Galway and Dublin in June of this year with panel discussions on a wide range of topics and over 800 submissions from the public to the forum. Now, The chair of the forum, Louise Richardson DBE, said that other areas of agreement were the need for reform of the United Nations and the absence of a popular mandate to drop the current policy of neutrality. Ms Richardson said that there were five contested areas, including NATO, with contrasting views expressed on whether it is, as most European political parties see it, a defensive alliance or, as some participants argued, an um, an expansionist aggressor. Other issues included the triple lock, which means that a mandate from the United Nations a government decision and a doll vote is required to send more than 12 troops overseas. Many argued for the triple lock to be changed, believing it to be an unwarranted abdication of sovereignty to cede to external parties authority to decide on the deployment of Irish troops. The report outlined an agreement of the need for greater public expenditure on all three branches of the Defence Forces, as well as on critical maritime infrastructure and defence against new threats such as cyber warfare. Uh, Ms Richardson said it was evident from the discussions that there was no agreed definition of the term neutrality, saying it clearly means different things to different people. She said, looking at the position of other neutral countries in Europe, Ireland is clearly an outlier, saying that Austria, Finland, Sweden and Switzerland all invest heavily in their defence forces. They have conscription and very large reserves to supplement their significant standing forces. Ireland is not and never had been in a position to defend its neutrality, unlike other neutral European countries. All of that in quotations. And I continue uh, to quote, neutrality without the means to defend it necessarily entails um, relying on the goodwill or enlightened self-interest of others. This is not an optimal position for any sovereign state, she said. And there there was widespread support among those who participated for increased expenditure on defence, as I said at the outset. It's an interesting outcome from that, and it'll be interesting to keep an eye on where it goes, considering where we are in the world at the moment. Um, Here are some news. You'd never know. Were you in County Monaghan by any chance recently? Well, the National Lottery has appealed for lotto players in County Monaghan to check old tickets from a draw which was held on the 19th of August as a prize worth over one million pounds, sorry, one million euro remains unclaimed two months on. The winning ticket, worth a total of one million and five hundred pounds, where am I getting pounds from? A euro was sold at Centra on Main Street in Emmyvale on Friday the 17th of August. The money was won in the Lotto Plus raffle, which organisers say typically sees as many as 120 people win €500. However, in this particular draw, one player won far in excess of this due to a special raffle event. Each ticket with the winning Lotto Plus raffle number drawn uh, on the Saturday the 19th of August draw were entitled into uh, or entered into a once-off random draw where one ticket was selected to win an additional €1 million. The winning raffle number for that draw was 3249. Winning ticket holders have 90 days from the draw date to claim their prize, meaning that the deadline to claim the money is Friday the 17th of November. Oh, imagine having 1 million and 500 euro won and you not knowing about it. Scary stuff. If you were in Monaghan in August and bought a ticket, check it, please. Here comes the news. I'll see you in two minutes after that. Talk Radio Europe. Your voice in Spain. Live on air, presented by Ger Sweeney. Storm Babette. That's the one that did the damage in the south southern part of the country today, uh, overnight. And um, there were continued heavy rains in parts of Cork today. And I know that Middleton, the army has been called in there because um, streets are impassable. And um, um, a, a WhatsApp group that I'm part of, one of the lads there sent through a few moments ago, um, 
photographs or not photo, a video of water literally pouring onto a pitch, um, a GA pitch, uh, obviously not being used, but um, completely submerged and the water flowing extremely quickly. So um, if you are in an area that's going to be hit by Storm Babette, do please lock, it, lock yourself down as best you can. I'm going to be talking about those um, warnings as well that the Met Service send, I know we get them in Spain uh, with extreme weather conditions are coming and all of that. And we get them in Ireland. Um, In fact, we got them um, the last couple of days over Storm Babette. But I'll come to that in just a little while. In this hour of the programme, I'm going to be talking to Richard O'Raw, who has written a book called Steak Knife's Dirty War. It's the inside story of Freddy Scappaticci, uh, the IRA's nutting squad and the British spooks who ran the war. It's a fascinating book. Um, I've already interviewed and spoke with uh, Richard and that took place last Thursday morning, in fact. And you will hear that interview this evening. It's more, than a, more a conversation than an interview. I don't like to do interviews. I like to do con- hold conversations. Um, and it's fascinating. So um, stay with me for that, please, if you would. Um, actually, that's all about Belfast and surrounding areas. But Belfast City Council has apologised for spelling mistakes on new dual language street signs in the city. A number of signs in North, South and West Belfast, which were erected yesterday have been misspelled in West Belfast LaSalle Park or Park LaSalle uh, is spelled a number of ways on its new street signs P-A-I-R-C is how it should be spelled but it's spelled P-A-I-R-E um, in some areas and um, yes and yes so the father would be important in there so P A father I R E and then there's one P A I R E with no father over the A um, after years of controversy a new language a dual language street sign policy was introduced in July of last year which makes the threshold of support for signage much easier than previously um, Belfast City Council has received over 600 applications in that time the overall cost of a Approving and putting up a dual language sign in the city is about a thousand pounds. Porico Tiernik of Conran de Guelga said that the mistakes were extremely disappointing and questioned why contractors came out today with white stickers trying to conceal the mistakes. Belfast City Council said that it is aware of spelling errors and said the signs are currently in the process of being replaced at no additional cost to the council. SDLP Belfast City Council Group Leader Seamus de Fuicha said that the situation was an embarrassing one for Belfast City Council and that significant checks need to be put in place to ensure that this never happens again. After the SDLP raised this issue with Council, we established that the correct spelling and translation were used in the committee report for this sign and this was provided to the contractor, he said. He added, obtaining Irish language signs or any other dual language signage for areas that want them look, uh, want them took a serious effort from campaigners and councillors. And this has been an embarrassing episode for the council. The least we should expect is that when requests uh, for these signs pass through council, that we can see them put in place in the correct manner. People would be cross over that for sure. Yeah. A commemorative stone for Edward Bruce, the so-called last High King of Ireland, uh, was officially unveiled in County Louth. The Bruce Boulder is located at the old um, Fockhart graveyard near, oh, near, Dun, um, near sorry, north of Dundalk. It was um, at the hill of Fockhart that Edward Bruce was killed in battle 705 years ago last Saturday. Some of his remains were believed to be buried in the old graveyard there. His direct descendant, uh, Charles Bruce, travelled from Scotland for a special ceremony to unveil the stone. It's one of a number commissioned by the Ulster Scots Agency to mark important sites linked with Edward Bruce. Edward was a brother of the King of Scots, Robert de Bruce, and led a three-year campaign in Ireland, starting with the invasion in 1315. After seizing the town of Carrickfergus in Antrim, he is said to have been proclaimed the King of Ireland and later crowned King in Dundalk. The complex campaign ended after Edward Bruce was killed at the Battle of Fockhart on the 14th of October in 1318. 
It was there that he depleted, his depleted army was defeated by Anglo-Norman forces. His head was sent to King Edward II and at least some of his remains are believed to be buried in the old graveyard in Fockhart. Um, a flat stone lies over the plot in the hilltop graveyard surrounded by magnificent views of Dundalk Bay. The stone forms part of the Bruce Trail and so far this is the only one located south of the border or outside Ulster. The trail is an initiative of the Ulster Scots Agency, which set up as part of the Good Friday Agreement and is responsible for protecting, developing and promoting the language, heritage and culture of Ulster Scots people. Although Edward Bruce predates the Ulster Ulster Scots, who came to Ireland from 1606, Ian Crozier, the chief executive of the Ulster Ulster Scots Agency, says that his story is of significance to them. Uh, They are stories of migration from Scotland to Ulster, he said. The short distance between Scotland and Ulster is a distance that people have been travelling for thousands of years and we are the latest example of that. So the same people who came with the Ulster Scots from 1606 onwards are probably some of the people whose families were there with Edward Bruce in 1315. Mr Crozier said it was important for people to understand the complex shared history involved. There are a lot more nuances to history in Ireland than we often think, he says. It's very easy to go for Wikipedia myths, stories and ideas handed down through a generation which doesn't necessarily reflect history. It's important for us to understand what actually happened and the complex relationships that have existed between different peoples throughout these islands for 2,000 years or more. A son of the Earl of Elgin and 37th Chief of the Bruce, Charles Bruce, said that um, he was representing his father, who was about to turn 100 years old in February. Wow, fabulous age. I am a lineal descendant of Edward Bruce, who died here at the Battle of Hockhart. He was the only surviving brother of King Robert. It was a moment when the family almost disappeared without trace, so we kept going. We had the crown of Scotland for two generations and very briefly held this extraordinary position of High King of Ireland from 1315 to 1318, he said. Mr. Bruce said that there was a kinship connection between Scotland and Ireland. It's wonderful to be part of living history and it means different things to different people. So it's very inclusive. Local historian Dr. Alison Lennon says that the Bruce campaign is a very early example of the shared history between Ulster and Scotland. She explained that Edward Bruce was sent here by his brother Robert, who was the King of Scotland and was fighting the Scottish War of Independence against England in the early 14th century. She said the purpose of the campaign was to open a second front against the English by attacking the Anglo-Normans and that a lot of Gaelic leaders would have aligned with him initially. Before his his defeat and death at Falkirk, Bruce, Edward Bruce, was Grand King of Ireland. He was the last, or it was, he was the last time that we had one king supposedly reigning over the whole of Ireland. It wasn't actually quite that simple. It was very complex war and the campaign here in Ireland was a complex one, she said. But we do know that he was crowned High King of Ireland in Dundalk. Saturday's event was hosted by the Fockert Community f- uh, Group who want to raise awareness of the significance of the site, not just in relation to Edward Bruce. Alan McArdle said that the Fockhart that the Fockhart is oozing with history as the final resting place of the last High King of Ireland, but also its ancient history going back to the folklore of Coo Cullen and Queen Maeve and the facts around the birthplace of St. Bridget. It also boasts a holy well, a medieval abbey, a monastic site, and an Anglo Norman mut. Wow. There's a lot in there, isn't there? This man is from County Cork, I believe. His name is Sean Parnell. He's got a new single. Smooth. Never would have took this chance. Never would have took this chance. I don't blame me, don't you? You did the best you could. You did the best you could. I, I. To tell you the truth, I'm overfeeling To tell you the truth I can't see past myself 
Like that. It's brand new. It comes from a man by the name of Sean Parnell. He's from County Cork. And um, that is a song called Over Feeling Down. Like it. Okay. Let's do a quick break then. Come back to me just after that. And you will hear the conversation that I had with Ricky O'Raw about he, Richard O'Raw, about his brand new uh, book, which is called Steak Knife's Dirty War. More on that just after this. Live on Era, presented by Ger Sweeney. Steak Knife's Dirty War is a book that's been written by Richard O. Raw. It's the inside story of Scapatici, the IRA's nutting squad, and the British spooks who ran the war. Ricky O. Raw, lovely to talk to you. How are you? I'm dead on, Ger. It's a pleasure to be talking to yourself. And indeed, to yourself. I'm not all the way through the book as yet, but I am enjoying it immensely. Really enjoying it. So thank you kindly for sending it on to me and for making yourself available to chat to me. I- I've known the name. It seems like I've known the name Freddy Scapatici and Steak Knife for um, forever. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of the gift that keeps on giving, really, isn't it? Who was he? Yeah, well, well Freddy Scapatici... <clears throat> was a Belfast guy, of course. He was, he was born in 1846 to Italian parents, of course, was so named mm-hmm. Scapatici. He lived in the market area, grew up in the market area of Belfast. He joined the IRA. He had a very mercurial uh, career in the IRA, meaning he was always sort of a leadership, uh, a leadership level. And he turned out to be one of the biggest agents and formers forward slash that the British had in their arsenal and in their fight against the IRA. And that's that's the basic I mean the story's a lot more complicated than that. Mm. If you want a, a quick synopsis, that's about the height of it. He joined the IRA <laughs> in the early nineteen seventies. He was interned twice, but as you say, always at a management level or at a senior level within the organization. Was that because the provisional IRA when he joined it had very few members? They were gathering members and things like Bloody Sunday attracted more people to it. Would that be why he was in a senior position uh, at the early stages? Not necessarily. Okay. Uh, the area in which he lived, they were very uh, sort of mature, it, was, it was a sort of mature IRA company. Whereas in the likes of Bella Murphy, where I, where I, where I was in, in the IRA, it was they were all very, very young. You know, 
When I say young, I'm talking about 16, 17, 18 year olds. Yeah. A 20 year were a veteran. In the market, Syria was more older. And Scapatici had a presence about him. He was one of those guys who, when he walked into your room, you noticed him immediately. And he commanded a room. Scap would have went out with the boys for a drink. And the boys would have been guzzling the paints. But he wasn't. He just stood over a paint or sat over a paint to a max. And he'd have watched everything. He'd have watched everybody. And he was a natural leader. People can disparage him from now to kingdom come. But he was a natural leader. And he rose from the rank of ordinary volunteer in 1870. Joined the IRA. He joined the provisionals at the very start in, in December 1970. And, and as you say, Joe, whenever they were just gathering, putting together the structures in the various areas, etc., very, very rapidly he rose to become OC of the markets. And uh, in 1870, on 19th of August 1971, when the tournament was introduced, he was one of the first men that the police went for to in turn. And he had this presence of and people just knew that maybe it was, I mean, Anthony McIntyre, He's a former Republican prisoner, lived in the markets at the time, and he was enthused by the name Scapatici. Mm-hmm. He he seemed to think that this was something to do with the mafia. <laughs> he was a kid coming up, you know, <laughs> that, you know, Scapatici's the man. So uh, he had all of that, but he was a natural leader, and he came to the fore because of that. He was a small man by all accounts, small in stature, but commanded respect, as you say, and could control a room. And people were afraid of him, weren't they? Terrified, especially in the later years. He'd done three years and eight months all together in internment. But in internment, you weren't, you weren't charged. It was very, you had prisoner war status, mm. but it was very, very difficult because you never knew when you were getting out. You had no release date. Or as a sentence prisoner knows that on such and such a date, he's going to be released. That wasn't, could have been there forever. In 1977, the IRA formed the Internal Security Unit. Up until 1977, different brigades had intelligence officers who would have been on the lookout for potential informers, touts, call them what you will, and stuff like that. But it wasn't really centralised. And then in 1977, this 78, I don't remember, the exact, there's no exact date as to when they were formed. Mm. But the Internal Security Unit was formed, and Scapatici was number two, adjutant of that, of that unit. The OC of that unit was a guy called John Joe McGee, who was an ex-British soldier, special boat services soldier. He was a special forces guy in, in the British Army at one stage. And then when the troubles broke out, he joined the IRA. And Scapatici was, he scared the third of IRA people because basically it was IRA people whom the internal security unit, a.k.a. the Nutton Squad, it was IRA people that they were trying to dig out mm. because it was IRA people who would have been privy to the real heavy intelligence that the British needed. Who's out in operations? How operations are going ahead? Who, where the guns came from, all of that stuff that would be useful to the enemy could only come from people who were on, at the cold face, from IRA people. So he scared out of them. And Scapatici went into an area, him and John Joe went into an area, people bunkered down because they knew trouble was on the way. Mm. They didn't know who particularly they were coming to interrogate or what their strategy was, but they knew that there was trouble. Trouble had arrived at their door. The ISU, or the Uh Internal Service, or the Internal Security Unit, that was set up to find out who was telling Uh the the British about what was going on in the IRA. So you can imagine exactly why they would have been scared when they see Scapatici and and others from the ISU arriving on the scene. Um, Before we go any further into it, you make the point in the book at the start that Scapatici wasn't terribly politically aware when he was growing up. So how did he get involved with the IRA? What what dragged him in? Well, what dragged him and what dragged almost all IRA volunteers in was the eruption in 1969 
The civil rights campaign had been going for three or four years with John Hume, Damon McCann, Bernadette Devlin, uh, Michael Farrell and co. Mm. And uh, they had been marching and getting beaten off the streets. They did it was peaceful marching. They were peacefully trying to bring around uh, a more democratic northern state. Mm. You know, they weren't they weren't talking about United Ireland's or anything like that. They just wanted a, 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 a fair deal for everyone, for nationalists, one man, one vote, better housing, fair housing, better job opportunities, basic human rights. I mean, that's what they were marching for, and they were beaten off the streets by the police and by the loyalists. And it culminated in the Battle of the Bogside, and then Belfast erupted. And whole Catholic streets, it was was, was modern-day ethnic cleansing. Whole Catholic streets were burnt to the ground Mm. by loyalists and and Big B Specials. B Specials was a group of uh, special cops, right? Mm. They they weren't the ordinary cops. They were sort of paramilitary cops. And they they covered the loyalists while they threw petrol bombs into the Catholic houses. And they had the vista of women running up the street holding their children. They escaped the flames. Mm. And the whole Catholic streets were born in them. I mean, in Ardoyne, in Divis, and Clyde, right? D- different areas of Belfast. And to say it was a shock would be an understatement. It was like a heart attack, right? To nationalist people. And out of that came a body of, of, of men who, who were primarily revolutionaries Billy McKee, Conscious McCart. And, and guys of that nature, mm-hmm. along with Rory O'Brady and Sean McStephane, etc., they formed the Provisional IRA, and people flocked to it. Initially, Scapatici would have flocked to it because it was seen as a defensive organisation, an organisation that would defend the streets, that would defend the people, right? Where there was no defence prior to this, the official IRA, the, the old IRA, Pre-69 were very, very poorly armed and didn't do a great deal to defend anybody. You know, that's just the way of it. Mm. And uh, so this new outfit, this new provisional IRA organisation seemed to be the way forward. They seemed to be the more militant and that was a, that was a big attraction. They seemed to be the guys that if the armed cops are coming up your street, they're going to dig out guns. And you're going to be able to stand there and defend your home, defend your family. That was the primary motivation behind people joining the provisional IRA. Mm. There were there was a, there was another aspect, of course, there were people who believed in the United Ireland, but they were in a minority, a very small minority. Most people joined the provisional IRA in Belfast, at least, to protect their homes and their families. And Scapatici was one of them. How long was he on active service within the IRA before he started to tell stories, or can that be pinned down? Well, he wouldn't have been on active service too long because the original IRA was formed in 1970, December 1970, and he was interned on the 9th of August 1971. Mm. So there's 18 months, and then he was in for another three years, eight months, right? So that brings us up to five years and six months. And then when he got out of internment in, in December 1975, he was involved with intelligence, uh, a brigade intelligence unit. He was what we, what the IRA called a squirrel. Intelligence guys were called squirrels because they were always beavering away, squirreling away. Right. He wasn't really on the cold face with rifles. And ambushes and stuff. He was not. He wasn't attacking really army, etc. He wouldn't have been doing that. He'd have been interrogating people even then. Now he didn't have the fearsome reputation that he ended up with mm. because they, the Nutland Squad hadn't been formed. But he was certainly that was his forte. Okay. His forte was interrogation. He was very, very good at it. The reckon he was the best that the IRA had in terms of interrogation. When the Nutton Squad was formed, it was a natural progression for him to move into it. Okay. Certainly in a leadership role. So do we know when and how his connections with British intelligence came about? Well, that's one of the big conundrums about Scapatici. 
the British say that he was a walking, that he just walked into the barracks one day and said, guys, I want to be in your side, right? Mm -hmm. And there's problems with that because British intelligence units are very suspicious of that sort of a setup Mm. because they they tend to think that this is the IRA testing them out. Also, it it, it raises suspicions as to the stability of the the guy that's walking in because if he can flip so easily, he could just as easily flip the other way again. (laughs) Sure. Right? Yeah. You know, so they have problems with that. And I, I, I don't think that's what happened. There's a whole scenario, it's a whole wrath of reasons why he could have. Nobody knows the exact reason. Mm. Um, my suspicion is, is that he was caught doing something that was very, very compromising and he was blackmailed into working for them. Everybody, or virtually A to Z in the IRA, who ended up being agents or informers, didn't do so voluntarily. They were all blackmailed mm-hmm. by either the British British Army intelligence or the special branch into working for them. They didn't do. They didn't. They didn't say. Oh, all of a sudden, oh, well, I'm fed up with the IRA. I think I'll go and do a wee bit of work for for the British Army. They were blackmailed into doing it. My instinct is that scap would have been the same. Mm. As you say, nobody knows exactly where it started and when it started, but because he was part of the ISU, he was interrogating and he has been um, um, associated with some of the killings that were associated with that as well down through the years. So you make the point in the book, actually, that, you know, the IRA in the early days thought that the ultimate proof of your bona fides was the fact that you would shoot somebody. And the British intelligence had told one informer, you continue to shoot the IRA people that you're told to shoot because nobody would expect that somebody who's informing would shoot another informer. And that leads back then to the whole thing about the security services or special branch allowing certain IRA attacks to happen and their own people be killed to protect the person that was informing. So it's it, it's one of those long games, isn't it? That there are so many different conundrums and it's all about waiting for the big one and something like Lock Hall uh, would be considered a big one. Would I be right? Yeah, well, you, everything you said there was absolutely right. Um, from the get-go, the measure by which the internal security unit was measured was how many people they were able to catch and assassinate or execute, call it, or, or call it what you will. Mm-hmm. And Scapatici was very active, right? He was involved. There is, people have told me, many right people have told me that he was involved in at least two, he killed at least two guys. Okay. He actually fired the shots into the back of their heads on and, and at least two, on two different occasions. But he would have been one of a small council there have been him, John, Joe McGee, maybe one or two others who would have decided that John Black is an informer and John Black should be executed. The basis for fighting John Black, an informer, would have been that John Black confessed. Mm-hmm. If he had an informer, John Black could well have been tortured into, into, you know, and broke and confessed to being an informer because nobody in the right mind is going to confess to being an informer without some sort of serious pressure. Mm-hmm. Knowing that the end product is going to be, you're going to be found in a country room with a bullet in your head. So they used torture when they needed to. And Scapatici was central to it all. Scapatici was probably the big decision maker in terms of, of the recommendation because he was the top and dirty kid. There was none of them touched Scapatici in terms of the sharpness you could have said something half an hour ago and stately contradicted it in real terms and he'd have remembered and he says, but you said that then. Mm. Why, why are you changing your tune? And stuff like that. So he was very, very good at it. As I say, he was right from the get-go, right from the foundation of the internal security unit. The belief is that Scapatici, right from the word go, was working for the British. Right? And he would have lifted the phone and told his handler, John Black is in 14th of Hostable Street mm. right now. 
and John Joe McGee's with them, and two or three other guys. They're all in the house with this guy, and I may as well tell you, at nine o'clock that night, he's going to be shot dead in Dunmore Street, Andrew. Okay. Right? Mm. And so that would, he'd have told his handler, we would have passed it up the intelligence lane until eventually it arrived on the desk of uh, an intelligence body that overarched everything. They were the, they were the real decision makers. Called these guys the Tosking and Coordinating Group, TCGs mm. for short. The TCGs was an amalgamation of all the British intelligence units, or you see Spicer Branch. E4A, E4A was a sort of a, 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 SA, a police SAS team, right? That actually that was responsible for various operations. Then you had MI5, you had Force Research Unit, which was known as the FRU, mm-hmm. which, which ran the agents. And you had other, uh, other agents, smaller agencies as well. But that was the task and coordinating group. So they would have received. Scapatici's report that John Black is going to be shot in Dunmore Street at 9 o'clock tonight. So they have a decision to make. Do they intervene and save John Black's life? Right? But if they do, they run the risk that Scap will be aired. Scap, there'll be an internal IRA inquiry and that Scapatici could very well be seen as the person who told the, mm. the cop we were about it. Do they protect their agent or do they let the, uh, probably the other agent, the, the John Black, whoever he is, do they let him die? And nine times, nine times, almost invariably, they let the guy get shot dead mm. in order to cover for their agent or agents. Right? They played, as you said, the long game. They always had their, head, their eye on the long game. And the long game wasn't even about law call. The long game was about making sure that the peace lobby in the in, in the Republican movement, the the Adams uh, McGinnis uh, Morrison sort of alliance, who by the early eighties had certainly come to the conclusion that the war was wasn't going to be won through military means. Mm. They were working away. Adams, as you know, was meeting uh Char- wasn't meeting Charlie Hawkey, but he had communications with Charlie Hawkey and he had communications he was meeting John Hume. John Hume. He was trying to forge a political path. He was trying to get out, take the IRA away from armed struggle. And that was the long game. Right? That was what the British seen and what the British was trying to do was to neutralize the the hard men, the men who would have fought on, who had no intentions of throwing in the towel or, or, or doing that. Mm. As far as they were concerned, the IRA wasn't beaten. Mm. And they, they didn't fought on. And that's what Scabatici was about. Scabatici was about undermining those guys. But, and in the process, he was bolstering the Adams lobby, the peace lobby. And because he was so high up in the organisation, there was nobody had any suspicions at all that Scapatici was passing information to the British. But in the book, you say that back in the 80s, uh, probably mid to late 80s, the South Armagh Brigade became suspicious. And they said, that's it. He, he has nothing more to do with this side of the house and he doesn't need to know what's going on. That was the first inkling. But when did it all start to unravel for Scapatici? You're quite right. Scapatici was held in the highest of esteem. Scapatici was on the court of inquiry into the Lockwell massacre. Yeah. Right? Uh, that's how highly he was respected. He was uh, he he was involved. I think he was on the court of inquiry into the, the Gibraltar killings. He was very highly respected everywhere except in South Africa. South Africa, man, and you have to hold your hands up to them. They had the wit to say this guy's not straight. Mm. There's just saying in the IRA he was wrong. Okay. If somebody, somebody's not right, he's wrong. This guy was wrong, and they had to witness the it. They sent the word up to Belfast, we don't want him back here, and he's wrong, and you shouldn't be, and you guys shouldn't, uh, should be looking at him, and they'd nothing, nothing, nothing happened. Scabatizzi just went up out his normal business, taking people, arresting people, uh, talking to new recruits, etc., doing all the stuff that, that was his daily chores. 
And the South Armagh guys never had him back. And that's South Armagh was never penetrated. And you have to say to yourself, was it because they had the wit to see Scapatici for what he was mm. and deny him access to their business? It wasn't until 2003 that he was out it. And there had been rumours from about 1999, Liam Clark, the journalist Liam Clark wrote a, an article in the Sunday uh, the Sunday Times saying that there was a top IRA guy called Steak Knife out there somewhere, but he didn't identify him. And um, he was identified by a former free soldier mm. called Ian Hurst, also known as Martin Ingram, who co wrote the first Steak Knife book with uh, Greg Harkin. Mm-hmm. I interviewed Hurst for the book, and I found him a very credible guy, certainly a man of conscience. Didn't strike me as a money grabber or anything like that. There, he struck me as a man who I asked him the question that you asked me: uh, Why did you uh, sort of bring him up in the first place? He says, he says, "I was appalled at what the British were doing. He says I was aware that they were letting people die, and I was a part of it. I was I was a member of their intelligence unit, the Force Reaction Unit, and he says it just kept working away at me until finally he said, the hell with it, I'm going to go." Come to the public. He went to Liam Clark and for a play to him, he told Liam the score. Liam, Liam put it out there. Nothing really happened. And then until, until 2003, by which time Neil Mackay from the Scottish Herald, uh, as I say, Greg Harkin and, and some others, realised it was Scapatici and they broke the story and they said it was Scapatici. He tried to uh, to brazen it out. He tried to say it's not me. Um, okay. Uh, he was going nowhere. He actually was interviewed by the Amherst Town News, and he says, they're all saying I did this, and I was responsible for X amount of people getting killed. He says, I want all those families to be gathered up, and I will go to them, and I will look them in the eye, and I will tell them, I did not kill your sons. I have nothing to do with your sons. I didn't know your sons. He knew every one of them, but he is prepared to do that. And he was getting away with it. He wasn't going. Scapatichi knew. See, the minute I get on the boat or the plane to go to England, the game's up because you only run mm-hmm. if you're running from something, right? So he was prepared to stick it out. And then in 19, or sorry, 2004, a journalist called Sylvia Jones, who had been part of the Coop Report, Coop Report came in the 2000, or 1983 to interview Martin McGuinness. And Scapatici had been off the rails by then. He'd been put out of the IRA. The IRA suspected him, but they couldn't prove it. And put out of the IRA, he was off the rails. He gave an ad hoc interview to the Coop Report, and then they were, they were told by Special Branch to bury it. Okay. So, so oh, yeah. they, they buried for, for 10 years, and then Scapatici was out it. He was, he was, he was just, just brass knacking it out. He, was, he had a brass knack. He was brass knacking it out, and then this girl, Sylvia Jones, released the pip and there was Capitigi, the Sparrow to McGuinness, saying that Martin McGuinness had was the man who had to pass all the killings. That's right. And, yeah. Yeah, and stuff like that there. And, and the whole rigmarole about the, the English department. And she also wrote an article in which she, she related about Scapatici coming to them in, in the hotel in Belfast. So the game was up and that's how he was caught. He done a runner. He, he finally realised there's no more bluffing. Games up, and he went. Did he leave the rest of his life in um, hiding then? He did. Initially went to Manchester to his brother. And his brother, his brother I think, had a cafe, some wee, a wee business in Manchester. He went over there, and his family didn't go with him. The thing about Scapatici was he was a family man. See, for all, all his... Um, his Machiavellian behaviour and his skullduggery. He was very, very good to his family. He brought them away on holidays. Mm. Three times a year, he changed his car. He brought them to the swimmers. He was he was attentive to his kids, etc. He had six kids, and then he worked. He had to work ethic. He went, didn't have to work. He was he was in money. He, he, was, he was doing a, a tax fraud scheme. That's right. Incredible. That's a 715. 715 scheme, right? Which is crazy, right? 
the British government give guys that were self-employed virtual blank checks yep. to rate to rate their own pets. <laughs> right? And a lot of these guys is alcoholics, so they they auctioned their book, they auctioned their checkbooks off, and whoever got the checkbook could use it any way they wanted, put any figure they wanted on it. So, so Scott was into that. Ian Hurst said he was getting eighty thousand pounds a year, which was a fortune back in the early late seventies, early eighties. So he had plenty of money, and he thought his life was perfect. He was doing his family stuff, and then at nights or whatever, he was he was free to do his IRA stuff. At the same time, he was working for the Brits. So everything was falling into place, and then. For some reason, in the 1989, he was a, a guy was arrested called Sandy Lynch, and the cops intervened, and they saved his life. They arrested Donny Morrison and five or six other guys, and Scappatici got away. Okay, but he didn't get away because his thumbprint was on the buzzer. These buzzers that they used they used to see if someone was wired. Okay, if, if the suspect was wired. His, his finger fingerprint was on the buzzer, so it was a strong prima facie case against him. Plus Lynch and the other guy who owned the house put him right on right on the spot. But he came back; he was arrested, and he was let out because he was one of theirs. He got away with that there, right? Didn't seem to be too perturbed. This is amazing. But besides the point, he was let go. He was no longer the top man, mm. and yeah, and then not the squad. He wasn't even. He wasn't even potentially an IRA volunteer. He walked into a room through the IRA people and he was told to off, just literally like that, get out, you have no place here. And that triggered what is known as a narcissistic collapse. He was a narcissist, right? He believed that he was the most important person in any room, that the world revolved around him, that everyone had to look up to him. And then all of a sudden, Collapses, somebody tells him to help off, and he's humiliated. He walks out of the room with his tail between his legs, and he's humiliated. A narcissistic collapse triggers very irrational behavior. Hence, his meeting with uh, Sylvia Jones out of the coop report. Another crazy things that this, this guy was doing prior to that, there, he was absolutely rock solid. His behavior was rock solid. He was totally impregnable in terms of. Uh, suspicion after that there he went off the rails and that's why eventually got caught that's why Sylvia Jones eventually earned him 10 years later when he went away and he was living in he was hiding until he died did he keep quiet or did he continue to act irrationally or do you know after he was dismissed from the IRA in 1981 in the room there he had bad health he started seeing uh he had mental he had mental problems, he had mental health problems. And he always he had them right up until the end. When he went to England, he had a couple of uh, strokes. His family didn't go with him, you see. So he was virtually on his own. His wife used to go over. His wife was a very beautiful... I mean, I spoke to a lot of people who had nothing but the utmost respect for Sheila, mm. the town of O'Neill, calling home to her maiden name. They had the utmost respect for her. Well, they had the utmost disdain for him. She went over to him every fortnight, right? Even though she had motor neurons disease, yeah. she still made her way over to him to comfort him to be there or to, to have, so that he'd have some sort of human contact. The impression that I've always had of him living over there was that his money was no good to him because he couldn't really share it with anybody. He wasn't a drinker. Yeah. So he cut him out of the boys and got black. He, he wasn't. He wasn't that sort of a guy. Here was a very lonely, forgotten guy who was wallowing in his own self pity. Because I, I would imagine that that's exactly what he done. Did you know him? I did know him, but I didn't know him well. I met him in internment uh, in 1993, 94. 73. Or 73, I beg your pardon. And then I knew him. I knew him on the outside, but only to say hello to. I'd never ever any dealings with him. All right. Why did you write the book, though? Well, actually, it was a commission. This is my sixth book, and I had just finished a novel called Gurion's Gold. My publisher, Connor Graham of Mary and Press down there in Kildare, was up in the house at two thousand and twenty Christmas. 
and we were sitting there and I was just sitting talking. And he said to me, Rick, do you fancy doing a book for me? I was I didn't I didn't want to go back to doing and this type of book, factual books. I, I actually they trick you because you can go wherever you want. Yeah. And you know, there's nobody's gonna try and trip you up no matter what you say because you're in a you're you're in a fantasy world. That's it. So I had no real intentions to come back to factual books. And he says, What about a book on steak knife? On scat teenager, I was I was in two minds. I, I knew this guy's messy. <laughs> this isn't going to be a nice wee handy. Let's have a nice wee book about uh, Michael D or somebody yeah. where everything's nice and falling into place. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. This is going to be messy. And, but I thought about it and I said, oh, why, why not? Why not? I, um, I have a publisher in America and they were looking for another my two novels are based around a guy called Ruxin Joe Burr, right? And he's a he's a film, but a likable film. So they were looking a third Ruxin Joe Burr book. It's going to be starting shortly. But Connor said to me, look, and he persuaded me to do it. And so I just took it, and the next thing I had to say, harm, harm, well, harm, we're going to approach this. Uh, because there was a plethora, there's a whole heap of books on on how the British security could penetrate the IRA. And I says, hold on, you know what hasn't been really heard here? This this subject from an IRA point of view. So I, you know, I know a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And I says, hey, well, let's see what the, the guys themselves think of it. And let's go to the various cases around the North, etc and get opinions of them about this whole subject. And that's the approach that I took. And so I, I mean, there was an awful amount of research on it. Mm. And um, but, but I got it done. And I'm glad I got it done. I think it'll help in the overall uh, scheme of, in the overall history of the troubles and, and what will what really happen. It's not the end all, it's not the be all, but it'll certainly help. It'll help. It's a perspective. Listen, you've been very kind with your time. I really do appreciate it. And before I let you go, let me just ask you finally, how was it for you going back into those days and talking to men and women about that period of time? Was it difficult? It was, it was, there because you're sitting talking and guys are talking to you about there's a lot more said than what's in the book. They're talking to you about apps that were compromised. They're talking to you about things that they have sat on all their lives. Mm. And um, all of a sudden, they have, an opp- they have an opportunity to get it out. And, you know, I, I just find a lot of it quite overwhelming, to tell you the truth. I taped everybody. Mm. A lot of my tapes went to three and four hours per person. Sometimes more, I got to go. I was, I was in the car three or four times a week for quite a while. Down to various places in the north, down to Monaghan, down to Oma, down to Derry, all Belfast, the whole heap. And, and the, you know, the guys, by and large, the guys were very generous with their times. But it was harrowing too, because they were going through reliving stuff that they probably buried. And then all of a sudden, they were back in it. So it was, it was pretty, I found it pretty harrowing to tell you the truth. All right. The name of the book is Steak Knife's Dirty War, written by Richard O. Raw, the inside story of Freddy Scapatici, the IRA's nutting squad, and the British spooks who ran the war. It's available for listeners on our website on tre.radio. We have a virtual bookstore there, so it's available there for any of our listeners that want to get their hands on it. Ricky, it's been fascinating talking to you. It's a great read. I'm really enjoying it. And thanks a million for talking to us about the book today. It's my pleasure and thank you so much. It was lovely. I enjoyed it. I was far from my mind. I was so far behind With the autumn light in my eyes 
I was rolling home A drift and alone Late for the day Like a skimming stone October sun What have you done? You'd make a fool of each and every one. October sun, where will you run now that you've broken rank with each and every one? And it comes from Oshin Leach. He's got some help in there. A song that's called October Sun. A couple of weeks ago, I introduced you to Pat Foody, who was um, and still is, I think, touring secondary schools in County Clare, um, talking about road safety and tyre safety and the importance of having the right tyres on your car and the family car if, you you know, students don't have a car themselves. Uh, But I see that a new road safety programme is being introduced to secondary schools around the country. It comes as 152 people have been killed on Irish roads since the start of this year, a 30% increase on the same period last year. Assistant Car, the Commissioner in Charge of Roads, Policing and Community Engagement, Paula Hillman, said that the education programme is aimed at fifth and sixth year students and, um, and above. But it can be extended out to other groups, such as clubs and workplaces. It's targeted at adults and young people about to start on their journey of driving, she said. She explained that the goal is to educate people and bring home the absolute human tragedy and impact of road deaths in people's lives. Ms Hillman said that the programme is impactful and the message is about how we can all, by our own behaviours, help all of us to stay safe on the roads. Under the road safety strategy, not one area will actually, um, not one area will actually deliver the results which we need, which is to reverse the absolute devastating trend that we've seen, she said. Uh, she went on to say that there are specific road safety plans for bank holidays and one in place for October, and there will also be similar plans in place for Christmas and the new year. She was speaking on RTE Radio 1 where she rejected the suggestion that the rise in road deaths is linked to fewer guards on the roads. And just very quickly, I won't get to all of the story, but I did mention I was going to mention it. Met Aaron has today said it will it will be issuing fewer yellow weather warnings in response to warning fatigue among the public. The change of approach was announced by Met Aaron's new head of forecasting, Owen Sherlock, at the launch of the government's annual Be Winter Ready information campaign. 
Mr. Sherlock said that Met Aaron is co- cognizant of the fact that there have been too many yellow warnings. From our perspective, we issue warnings based on the thresholds. He say, explained that Met Aaron has looked at the thresholds for warnings and said that with yellow warnings, the organisation will be increase, increasing the threshold for wind speed. Perhaps, he said, for low temperatures, they wouldn't be as prevalent as they are now. Sherlock said that the uh, warnings are useful for some people, but for the rest of the population, a yellow warning just means it's a soft day. So there we go. There's some big changes in that one. Um, because, yes, there are quite a lot of weather warnings that pop up on our phone screens, aren't there? Indeed. Right. I think that's it, isn't it? We're done and dusted. We've everything covered that we wanted to cover. Can I say a big thank you to Richard O'Raw, the author of Steak Knife's Dirty War, for joining me this evening on the programme. Thanks, as always, to Antonio Sierra, our Spanish-Irish cultural advisor on the programme. Thank you most especially for listening. And I hope that you join me next Wednesday for another edition of Live on Era from me, Jer Sweeney. Bye-bye and thank Thank you. Jer Sweeney presents Live on Era in association with EmeraldConnection.net. You've been listening to a TRE production. If you've enjoyed this program, there'll be another episode waiting for you next week, right here on this platform, where you can also access our extensive back catalogue of shows and interviews. For more information on our live programming, social media channels and apps, and how to contact Talk Radio Europe, please visit tre.radio.